All right, everybody, welcome back. This is the lecture corresponding to Worksheet 20. It's titled Antiderivatives, and antiderivatives is just a name for something. It's a mathematical entity. Um, this is the worksheet that you guys have, and really what we're going to be doing is, for example, let me just, before we go into all this detail, I want to summarize. So I have a lot of really explicit detail for you to read over and just look. This. I put a lot of time into this so you guys can just have your own little template on how to, like, how to look over it. And uh, notice that uh, <laughs> I use the heart symbol here because I know everyone here in this class loves math, right? So that definitely merited me using that. Okay, and so and everyone in general loves math, right? That's just a universal fact, so why not use a heart, right? We all know that. Okay, so like the whole, let me just show you the whole idea behind this because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with this. So first of all, let me tell you definitely, let me focus, there are some subtleties where that, uh, where in terms of like the existence of an antiderivative, there's a whole existence theory behind them in general. But really in the back of your mind, the idea, what's happening here is this. If I give you f of x equals to x squared, and I say find f prime of x. All right, you're going to give me 2x, right? Power rule. Okay, this is the power rule. Okay, so now antiderivative is, we're just going to be going backwards. So antiderivative, we're just going to be going backwards. So I'll give you some function g of x, maybe it's 2x, and I'll say, hey, find the function whose derivative is 2x. So let's call it capital G. Which function should I differentiate to get 2x? Well, you know it's going to x squared. If I differentiate x squared, I get 2x. But remember to add this c because the derivative of any constant is 0. So the generalized antiderivative is this. If I differentiate this, I get that. So in antiderivatives, we're just kind of going backwards. Remember the power rule that if I have y equals x to the n, y prime equals x uh, n times x to the n minus 1. Well, for antiderivatives, we're not, I don't want you guys to memorize formulas. That's the wrong, that, at, at this point in calculus 1, I want just you to be familiar with them and be able to get your hands on them. A lot of you, this is a terminal math class. Um, but if, if you're curious, the formula, capital Y, the antiderivative of that, would be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus the constant c. See, because if I differentiate this, capital Y prime, these things cancel, this power comes out, subtract 1, and I just get x to the n. You see, there's many antiderivative formulas, and they have engineers and uh, many different people working in like the quantitative fields. They will have many different, uh, you'll, you'll literally just see tables and tables of antiderivatives. And they'll just say, hey, because honestly, guys, they can get very complex fast. So if you want to find the antiderivative of something, a lot of times it's way, in general, the way people use this in the industry is, they'll either use symbolic software to calculate it, or what they'll do is they'll just look, in the old school times, they looked at, they looked at tables, but now it's, it's always symbolic software. It's just much more efficient and better. It's a symbolic calculation. So before we get to it, let me just introduce the notation. So, um... The notation for an antiderivative, so for example, if I have f of x equals x squared, the notation for a derivative that we're using is f prime of x equals to x squared. You could also use a superior notation called Leibniz notation, d dx equals to um, 2x, All right, and this is 2x, technically, <laughs> the derivative is 2x, right? I know you guys caught me on that, right? But see, the whole point is that you're viewing this d over dx as an operator. Okay, you may say, why use this? It's more writing. Well, in our class, because it's single variable, we're sticking to the prime. But in the worksheets and stuff, I like to expose you guys to this. They're used in chemistry and physical sciences, use Leibniz notation. And if you have a function of more than one variable, it kind of tells you this, this notation is superior. It just tells you which function, you're, which variable you're differentiating with respect to. Otherwise, prime would mean something completely different. It's, there's, and let me just tell you guys this. There are many different types of derivatives. The derivative we're encountering in this class is hundreds of years old. It's classical. It's the first one. There's many different types of derivatives, distributional, everything you could think of. Okay, uh, it keeps going. 
So anyways, the notation for antiderivatives that we're going to use that's common in calculus textbooks is just this thing. So if you see a problem like this, dx, what this really means is, what is the antiderivative of x? Well, you know, if I, it, just check it out. Pause, look at this, pause your, uh, the screen, and differentiate this. I promise you, you will get to x. Look, because the twos cancel, I subtract one, and this goes to zero. This is a zero. So this is the notation they use. It comes from uh, an integral. That's the motivation. This is supposed to look like a big S, standing for a sum. Remember I told you guys about the integral? Um, this is an old notation, and it's a really very, very bad misleading notation. The modern notation for antiderivatives is analogous to Leibniz notation. It's just d inverse of x. Which function has this as its derivative? Well, x squared over 2 plus c. This is a superior notation. This, this implies there's some limit being taken. There's not, there's no upper, upper and lower bound. This is just, uh, but that's just the notation we have to deal with, guys. That's why I wrote the worksheet in this notation. Um, this implies there's a partition being taken. We're going to get a little bit into Riemann sums a little bit, but antiderivative itself, there is no limit and there is no there's no integral or anything. Integral is a limit. This is just a symbolic calculation. So that's this is the notation. This means find antiderivative of the thing inside x whatever that thing is, this, that's all this means, okay? So look, let's go straight to the examples and see, if you look at the worksheet, I have an extremely detailed explanation of how to find this and how to do it, but in this video mini lecture, since you already have that in the worksheet, I want to get try to give you something a little extra, so let's just go over the examples. So find the following indefinite integrals. They call these indefinite integrals because there's no upper and lower bounds in integration. I know we haven't gotten to that yet. However, it's common to teach this first. Um, really, here's what this problem means. Find the antiderivative. What function has this as the antiderivative? And let me show you guys the way to figure this out. So we're dealing with this. Forget about the whole S and all the other stuff happening around. We essentially have this function, right? What function do I have to differentiate to get this? Well, in this class, and let me tell you something, guys. In calculus 2, it gets a lot more involved. Uh, but in this class, when you see something like this, here's the trick. Ignore the thing on the outside. And let's just look at this. What if I just forget about the stuff on the outside. Now this power, I add 1 to it, and I divide by it. Just keep this in general. Now, if I, if I just said, hey, differentiate this. The 11s cancel, I subtract, and I get a 10. But then, by the, so I got my 10, and I got my stuff inside. But then by the chain rule, a 10x would pop out, right? But I only have an x popping out here, so I would have to then divide by 10, or multiply by 1 over 10 to correct it. And that's what the antiderivative is. Remember, plus c. So it's just, if you want to write it more concisely, it's 5x squared plus 4 to the 11. Um, 10 times 11 is like what? That's like 110, okay, plus c. And trust me, and here's the good thing. The good thing about these types of problems, guys, is if you if you think you made a mistake, you can automatically go and just double check it. You can just differentiate this and see that, hey, you do get back to here. So they're not too bad to check. Now I'm going to go to the standard, uh, <laughs> our new whiteboard in the class, which is really just a sheet of paper to uh, write the other problems so you can see them clear. So number two is this. So what's the antiderivative of this? What function do I have to differentiate to get sine 4x? Well, you know, if I differentiate cosine, I get negative sine, right? So how about we start off with negative cosine, ignore the stuff on the inside, plus c. Now, the c is going to be 0 when I differentiate it. Let's check. If I differentiate negative cosine, I'm going to get positive sine. The 4x stays. The only thing is a 4 is going to pop out, but I don't have a 4 here. So the way to correct that is divide by 4. Now, if you differentiate this function here, here, this one right here, let's just go ahead and differentiate it. The c is going to be 0. 
derivative of cosine is negative sine, so the negatives cancel. And I get this, the c is 0. I still have a 4, but by the chain rule, a 4 pops out. So look, I get this, which is exactly the thing on the inside here. So you see how we're doing this? It's kind of like, that's the beauty of this. You can always kind of check your answer with this. So what I want you to do is I'm going to leave number three. So star number three on your worksheet. That's going to be the first homework for this one. And let's go on to a little bit more of the, I don't know how to say it, the worst ones, okay? Uh, number three is an extension of the stuff we just did. Okay, so I want you guys to attempt it. Don't be afraid of it. Just be robotic about it. Number four is secant squared x times root of tangent x dx. So remember what that means. Find the antiderivative of this thing. That's literally all it means. Okay, forget about all this other stuff happening here, this old school notation. So remember, start off with this. What if I have tangent to the one half? Forget about the stuff on the inside. That's the trick. Just think of it as x to the one half. I'd have to add one to it to make it three halves, then divide by that, which would be two thirds. Now, if I use the power rule and I differentiate this, what happens? Three halves cancels the two thirds. I have minus one and I get one half, which is that. But by the chain rule, a secant squared pops out. So this is it. This is the antiderivative. I promise you, just differentiate that. So you want to kind of look at this and eyeball it and kind of just see that, hey, this thing is the derivative of this thing. You know the derivative of tangent is secant squared, so just ignore it. It just popped out, and just deal with this. That's that's really the, that's the cognitive trick to deal with this stuff. Okay, so I want to go through more of these. Um, how about I leave number five as homework, and let's go do. So you have I'm gonna I'm only gonna give you three homework problems for this section, guys. I kind of just um, reinforce. The stuff we've been doing. So let's go ahead and, and number. I want to. I want to work over all the problems with the main traps. So let's do number six. What is number six? Find the antiderivative of sine of x over cosine cubed x dx. So here's another trick, guys. Anytime you see a cubed or something in this class, that means that that's like something popped out. Okay. Ignore that sign. And just think of it like this. What if I have 1 over cosine cubed x. Okay, what if you just have that? Let's take a divergence from this problem for a second. Okay, well, we're going to come back to it. It's cosine to the negative 3x, right? Add 1 to it, divide by that. That's cosine to the negative 2x over negative 2. Now, let's just look at this. If I differentiate this, what happens? The negative 2's cancel. Then I subtract 1 again to get cosine to the negative 3. This prime equals this. This is 1 over cosine cubed x. We did it. However, remember, there's something inside here. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so a negative sine x pops out. But look, I, so I have negative. I'm saying this. If you want to claim this function works here, cosine negative 2 x over negative 2, and let's just say plus c, you don't forget that, then the derivative you're going to get is this, this negative sine over cosine cubed. But I have a positive here. So no problem, just multiply the negative by a positive to correct it. Done. This is your answer for that. The answer is this, equals cosine, let's see if I'm right, negative 2x over 2 plus c. And remember, guys, I strongly encourage you to go back and differentiate this if, if, and didn't see that you get back to the original problem. And that's going to show you how to solve the problem. That's, that's really the main homework for this section. I'm only going to leave you like a little bit of homework for it. The real homework is to go back through these calculations and differentiate the answers to see that you get back to the thing inside of the integral, the antiderivative. So now look, let's, do, let's do number seven. 5 e to the x plus secant squared x. Okay, it's horrible writing, whatever. Right here. Actually, that's beautiful writing, guys. You all know it. So look, this is it, okay? So what function has 5 e to the x as its derivative? Well, that's 5 e to the x. 
That's why he, I told you guys you're going to like e to the x. It's its own derivative. It's also its own antiderivative. And what function do I have to differentiate to get secant squared? What's the derivative? What's the derivative of something that gives me secant squared? I'm sorry I had to say that. Now, what, what secant squared is the derivative of what? Tangent. And I add C. Done. This one wasn't bad, right? And see, so th you're done with the problem. Finish at this point, point okay? But I just, want to, I just want to show you a mathematical subtlety. You found the antiderivative of this. That's really 5e to the x plus c sub 1 with some constant. Then we found the antiderivative of secant squared, which is tangent x plus c sub 2, some other constant. So technically, the antiderivative is this, 5e to the x plus tangent x plus c sub 1 plus c sub 2. We're just calling that c. They're just random, not random, they're just general constants. It doesn't matter. So you don't have to write a constant for every term. Just add c at the end. Because when you differentiate, you're going to get 0. Anyway, we, have, we need additional information to figure out what c is. Okay? And now let me work the, the final problem for you. Okay, the final problem in this, c, is find the antiderivative of e to the 5 cosine x times sine x. So anytime you see something like this, guys, always think in your head, this, this thing popped out of that. There's a very formal mathematical way to describe such things, and uh, but in reality, the cognitive processes behind it, even with the most sophisticated mathematician and you're thinking in the back of your head, really is just like putting the triangle in the triangle hole. That's really that's all that's happening here, the square in the square hole. Okay, It's a symbolic manipulation. This function doesn't model anything. Okay, It's e to some oscillatory term. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't really have any value in an applied sense. Okay, we just we want to practice calculation here. So here's the trick. Just start off with this. Forget about that stuff. What happens if I differentiate this? Well, remember by the chain rule that we already did. The stuff stays the same. The derivative of the inside. What's the derivative of five cosine x? That's negative five sine x. So if I differentiate this, I get e to the 5 cos cosine x, that stuff stays the same, times negative 5 sine x. Now, it, all, it looks good. I have this term and this term. The only thing is that negative 5. That negative 5 isn't here. So what you do is simple. Just divide by negative 5 and correct for it. Now, the solution is this. Let me just write it neat. Uh, Let's see. And so, but do you see what happened here, guys? Like I just differentiated this, and then this thing uh, popped out. Okay. And I needed to fix it. So then the derivative is nothing but this e to the um, the the antiderivative. I mean, is e to the five cosine x divided by negative five plus c. That's it. I differentiate this. This stays the same. Negative uh, five sine x pops out. The negative fives cancel, and I get that sine x happening right there. And that's it, guys. So the ones that I assigned throughout this lecture, finish those for homework, turn them into me, scan them. Um, also, uh, I want you to go back through all these calculations and actually differentiate, like, for example, differentiate this to see that you're going to get that. And then there's one, and we're done with this pretty much. This is just a calculation thing. But I want to. I, I want you to. I want you to um, understand that. Do not underestimate how difficult it is to find an antiderivative. Okay, that's a, that can be. You could. They have. I mean, there's a reason why in calculus books that uh, you know the differentiation part, the differential calculus part, is significantly smaller than the integral calculus part. Integrals are much more complicated limits, and just calculating integrals involves finding antiderivatives, which can be very hard. So. For example, I can easily just write something like this. There's no known closed form antiderivative for this. There's no function that you can differentiate that's going to give me that. You can, you can use something called Taylor expansion. You can write it as a convergent infinite polynomial. And then you can approximate it, but there's no known antiderivative for that. Something that simple. And this function is very useful, guys. This function comes up a lot in modeling. So I'm just letting you know that don't underestimate it. These are toy problems out of a calculus book. And the main point is that I emphasize I want you to have a skill set in how to deal with it. So all right, guys. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.